As all of you know, Dennis Gardner, our National Register historian, passed away last month. I'd like to start the meeting by acknowledging the loss of our friend and colleague, and I'll ask that you join me in a moment of silence as we remember Dennis, his work, and his legacy. Thanks everyone. Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board and by, for the National Register of Historic Places. My name is Kristen Anderson and I'm currently chair of the review board. The board's purpose this evening is to consider the nomination of properties to the National Register of Historic Places. As most of you know, the National Register is a federal list of those places deemed worthy of preservation. A nomination form has been completed for each of the properties that will be considered tonight. Each nomination form has been sent to the review board members and each member has had an opportunity to study it prior to the meeting. The owners of nominated properties, local officials and interested local groups have been notified of this meeting. All have been invited to send written comments about the nomination and to attend this meeting. Some of you may wish to speak this evening about a particular property. You are welcome to do so, and I encourage you to address yourself to the question of whether that property meets the criteria of significance of the National Register. These criteria are the standards against which the review board will evaluate the nominations. This evaluation is the board's only assignment. These criteria have been established by federal regulation. Copies of the criteria have been sent to owners of nominated properties and to the other parties I mentioned earlier. A description of the National Register program has also been sent to them. Each of the nominations will be presented by a staff member. Persons viewing the meeting will remotely, remotely will be given an opportunity to comment. These comments should be limited to three minutes. The State Historic, Historic Preservation Review Board will then discuss the nomination and a vote by the board will follow. Should a nomination be determined this evening to meet the criteria for inclusion in the National Register, the nomination will be forwarded to the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer, Amy Spong. Should she agree that the property meets the criteria and that the nomination is in proper form, she will sign the nomination and forward it to the National Register Office in Washington, D.C., where it will be reviewed once more. The process is a lengthy one, but it is calculated to subject each property to rigorous evaluation. As we begin, I will simultaneously take the role and ask the members of the State Historic Preservation Review Board to introduce themselves, briefly stating the role that they fill on the review board and their particular expertise. Uh, and so I'm just going to go off the list in case someone has joined us uh, in the last few minutes. Board Member Brunfeld is not present. Board Member Decker. Are you muted, John? Board Member Decker? I'm John Decker. Thank you. Uh, I'm a member at large and I'm a retired archivist. Thank you. Board Member Dyer? Hi, um, Lindsay Dyer, member at large, librarian, archivist, preservation. Thank you. Board Member James? Hello, my name is Elliot James. I'm an assistant professor of history at the University of Minnesota Morris, and I'm one of the historians on the board. Thank you. Board member Koski. Okay, board member Lavasser. Are you muted? I'm, I'm Andre yeah. Lavasser, and I am the prehistoric archaeologist on the board. I am retired from the Chippewa National Forest, where I managed about 3,000 archaeological sites and historic buildings. And I need to add that um, I have a conflict tonight with another uh, another meeting at 7, so I will need to leave this group about 6.30-ish. Good. 
Good, thank you. Board member Mann. Hi, I'm Rob Mann. I am an associate professor of anthropology at St. Cloud State University, and I am the historical archaeologist on the board. Thank you, board member Olson. Steve, are you there? Are you muted? Hello, my name is Steve Olson. I'm a member at large. I'm a civil engineer, and I'm happy to see Amy has a bridge in her background on her screen. <laughs> a nice tribute. Board member Schilke. Hi, I'm Chris Schilke. I'm a member at large. I'm a public historian uh, with the executive director of the Otter Hill County Historical Society. Thank you. Board member Solomonson. I'm Kate Solomonson. I teach in the School of Architecture at the University of Minnesota, and I'm an architectural historian. And board member Stark. I am John Stark. I'm a preservation architect on the board, and I am a practicing architect in this one. Thank you. And I'm Kristen Anderson. I'm one of the architectural historians, and I teach at Oxford University. Uh, and now um, I'm going to hand things over to Amy Spong, uh, who has some uh, notes about Dennis and uh, and also updates from the board. Amy? Just, just a couple announcements. Um, we do have several of our, uh, our National Register team is here. Uh, my name is Amy Spong. I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. We have Michelle Decker and we have David Mather, our National Register archeologist and Ginny Way, who is our architectural historian. And I even saw a couple other staff who are tuning in this evening, um, Sarah Beimers and Leslie Coburn. I think if they're, I can't see the participant list completely, but we have a few other SHPO staff joining us. Um, sadly, this, uh, we, are, we are all really missing Dennis. Um, in this meeting and just in general at our at our SHPO um, office and with our team, uh, as as you can all imagine. And I, I do want to thank the State Review Board for their their kind comments and sharing memories with us. Um, I I want everyone to know that uh, when there were notes and emails sent um, when you were sharing your memories of Dennis. Um, I did share those with his family, and I, I think um, they were much appreciated. So I, I do want everyone to know that those um, those kind notes and uh, memories did get passed along um, to his family members. So um, I only have um, one additional comment, and that is, um, well, two things. I will just say um, I will continue to keep everyone apprised. Um, of a memorial service for Dennis. We, we still don't have any details on that, but I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we will continue to keep, um, to keep the board and, and others uh, informed uh, when that, when something gets, gets scheduled. And then um, I wanted to just, uh, maybe this is not a good segue maybe, but I'm switching gears. Um, I participated today, um, the Hopkins, City of Hopkins, had a wonderful press announcement today at noon announcing that their main street was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And I thought, how many communities um, do we have that really celebrate that? And um, they, they asked everyone to keep it a secret <laughs> until, until today. Um, and I think people did a good job in the community of doing that, but um, there were a lot of news outlets there. And uh, I just saw that WCCO even had a, a clip online um, of the mayor speaking and representative, both representatives, uh, Ilhan Omar and uh, Dean Phillips were both there um, at, the, at the event and the community made a huge banner that, that said, you know, Hopkins Main Street National Register Historic District. So I wanted to share that with everyone and you can probably catch it in print or on the news tonight or um, tomorrow. So that was that was just a fun, a fun uh, event to be able to attend and just to see a community really excited about the listing um, on the National Register. Um, and then Jenny, I think you have a couple updates for us as well. 
I do. Thanks, Amy. Um, I wanted to let people know that both um, the Coliseum Building and Hall and Calvary Lutheran Church uh, that we heard at last meeting have been listed in the National Register. They're both in Minneapolis, so we're very excited about that. Um, and I also wanted to give an update on um, St. Olaf's. We heard that um, maybe one or two meetings ago. Um, that has been returned by the National Park Service. Um, our contact there, our reviewer there is very excited about the significance, but wants a little more detail on the boundary as it passes through that hyphen between the, the parish center and the house. So the author is working on that um, and we have every expectation that once we're able to bolster that particular piece of technical information, it, it too will be listed. So we will keep you updated. Thanks, that is Jane. all for me. You're welcome. Amy, anything else? I have nothing else. Okay. All right, uh, the next thing we need to do is to approve the minutes from our February 15th meeting. Do we have a motion to do that? Uh, Chris Schulke, so moved. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Kate Solomonson, second. Thank you, board member Solomonson. I'll get it right this time. And any discussion, any corrections, any comments on the, the minutes before we approve them? Anyone, anything? Okay, um, we'll do our usual roll call. Board member Decker? Aye. Board member Dyer? Aye. Board member James? Aye. Board member Lavasser? Aye. Thank you, board member Mann? Aye. Board member Olson? Aye. Board member Schulke? Aye. Board member Solomonson? Aye. Board member Stark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you very much for that, everyone. And now we'll turn to our nominations. And I'll try to say what I'm planning to say. You'll notice in various versions of our agenda, tonight's agenda, that Dennis is listed as a presenter. And how much I wish that I could announce the nominations and then hand it off to him. But as a way of honoring Dennis's work on tonight's nominations and on his work of count on countless others over the last decade, we decided to list him once more and for the last time on the agenda. So first, uh, we'll be looking at the Frederick and Mariana Manfred House, Mount Township, Rock County. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And uh, this putting together the presentations was definitely a team effort um, without without Dennis. And so I wanna thank Jenny. She put together the whole presentation and um, I'm gonna do my best to, to present these two nominations this evening, but um, I, I do not have uh, Dennis's smooth radio voice. Um, so I, I'm sure you'll all be very patient with me. So here we go. The Frederick and Mariana Manfred House is in southwestern Minnesota, approximately two miles north of the city of Laverne in Rock County. The house is within the Blue Mound State Park. It is positioned at the southern edge of a geographic feature known as the Blue Mound, a linear escarpment of Precambrian Sioux quartzite bedrock, which features a range of vibrant tones, including pink, red, and purple. Built at the location of a former quarry, the Manfred House is integrated into its site. It is positioned below the crest of the Blue Mound and merges into the natural landscape. This is an aerial view of the Manfred House depicting complex geometry and southeasterly orientation. Oops. The house extends along the rock face of the quarry wall and is characterized by an overall rectangular form, which also incorporates complex triangular and hexagonal elements. Best described as an organic design associated with the Rydian style. The house was designed by architect Myron Caney and completed in 1961 for the author Frederick Manfred. The site for the house was selected because 
the Blue Mound epitomized Manfred's deep connection to the land and the literary inspiration it provided. The left is the photo of, rock, of the rock outcropping at the southeast edge of the Blue Mound facing northwest, and the right photo is the Manfred House facing northwest. Frederick Manfred was born Frederick Sikama in 1912 on a farm near Dune, Iowa. Manfred, writing under his given name, began his literary career with the publishing of his first book in 1944. Manfred's third novel, This is the Year, published in 1947, first coined the name Siouxland, a reference to what he considered his, quote, home territory, unquote, encompassing the Four Corners region of Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, and Nebraska. Interestingly, Siouxland became a popular term throughout the region. The left photo is the south elevation showing the projecting prow facing north. The right photo is Frederick Manfred autograph autographing copies of his book, This is the Year, circa 1947. Manfred began visiting Blue Mound with his father when he was a boy. Over the years, he continued to return to the Blue Mound and the broader Siouxland region while researching his books. In 1960, Manfred purchased the property with the intention of constructing a home and studio. Soon after, Manfred and Keeney began searching for appropriate building materials, eventually purchasing an 1879 school building being sold by the city of Laverne. The building was dismantled and the Sioux Court site was repurposed for the construction of the Manfred House. The left photo is the east end of the house depicting integration into the cliff wall facing southwest, and the right photo is the west end of the house with cliff wall facing northwest. Manfred moved his office equipment and books into his new writer's studio, or teepee as he called it, on April 10, 1961. On April 11, he began to write in the house for the first time, working on Scarlet Plume. The family moved into the house in April 1969. Manfred referred to the house as Blue Mound. The left photo is the teepee in view to the southwest, facing southwest. And the right is a photograph of Fred Manfred standing near the top of the spiral stairway in his writer's studio or teepee. The photo is undated. The Blue Mound epitomized Manfred's deep connection to the land and the inspiration it provided. The expansive surrounding landscape was visible from his writer's room with views as far as Iowa and South Dakota. Manfred's literary works exemplified the concept of, quote, literature of place, end quote and his characters were often shaped by their connections to the land while in search of self-identity. Manfred was a renowned author, nominated four times for the Nobel Prize in Literature and once for a Pulitzer Prize throughout his career. The right photo is the Manfred House depicting integration into the Blue Mound facing Southwest. The left photo is the Manfred House with view to the Southeast toward the Rock River facing Southeast. Architect Myron M. Keeney's design for the Manfred House is an example of organic architecture, which is characterized by the integration of the built and natural environments. Organic designs respond to the natural environment rather than impose upon it. While other modern stylistic movements promoted straight lines and right angles, organic architecture favored natural shapes and interesting geometries. A design for a building was conceived as reactive to both the environment and to the building materials and developed organically into one harmonious whole. The right photo is the projecting stone parapet wall and masonry mass of the fireplace with view toward the Rock River facing southeast. Engaged with a rock wall of Sioux Quartzite, the house is placed below the crest of a hill. The use of native materials, common in organic design, takes on meaning as a construction stone was quarried from the Blue Mound itself, allowing the masonry walls to blend visually into the existing rocky outcropping. The left photo is a stone wall at the west end of the house depicting integration into the cliff wall facing north, and the right photo is the west end of house facing northeast. The incorporation of the natural environment continues in the interior with the living rock wall forming the entire rear of the interior. Of note is the dramatic fireplace with a cantilevered stone hood. The left photo is the cantilevered fireplace in the living area facing northeast, and I apologize, we do not have a description on the right 
photo, but that is the um, historic image from 1961. The period of significance for the property is proposed as 1961 to 1972. The level of significance is state. The National Register criteria are both A and C. Areas of significance are literature and architecture. Let's see, I already read that. The period of significance, I will just add, um, sorry, I got um, a little mixed up on my, my slides here, but I'll just add that the cutoff date for the 1972 period of significance is based on the National Register's 50 year uh, guidelines. And the Frederick and Mariana Manfred House is considered significant at the statewide level because of Manfred's acclaim as an important Minnesota author. The property is associated with Frederick Manfred, an important Minnesota author whose works were set in a fictional area. You know, I'm wondering if I have the wrong um, PowerPoint presentation <laughs> up. No, this looks right, Amy. Is it right? Okay. It's usually a concluding set of photographs. Okay. I was just thinking because it said draft when I pulled it up still. <laughs> it wasn't the final. So I was worried that I was getting um getting a different version. Okay, I'll I'll go back to the, the statement. The property is associated with, with Frederick Manfred, an important Minnesota author whose works were set in a fictional area he called Siouxland, which encompassed the four corners region of Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, and Nebraska and the watershed of the Great Sioux River. His house and studio situated in Blue Mound directly influenced his literary work. Furthermore, the house represents a distinctive example of organic design. For these reasons, the Frederick and Mariana Manfred House is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. And this is a Southeast elevation facing Northwest. Thanks, Amy. And to Ginny in the background, thanks to both of you for this. <laughs> and um, do we have any uh, statements or comments from uh, people in the audience? Yeah, this is Rolf Anderson, I would like to comment. Hey, Rolf, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So well, first I would like to re reiterate uh, Prior comments uh, about Dennis, uh, I think our presence here tonight without him brings reality to his to his absence. And I, like I'm sure all of you have had difficulty comprehending the loss of our talented friend and colleague. You know, I had turned in the Manfred nomination to Dennis just nearing the deadline for submissions for this state review board meeting. And I know he had to find the time to process it, and I was very grateful and, and appreciative that he did. You know, I'd been exchanging routine emails with him about the nomination, and then just suddenly he's no longer with us. I know we'll all think uh, fondly of Dennis uh, throughout the evening. You know, I became involved with this project when I was contacted by the Save the Manfred House group, which was organized by friends and family members of Frederick Manfred once they had learned that the Department of Natural Resources was planning to demolish the house. They asked if I could determine if the house uh, was eligible for the National Register and then subsequently to prepare the nomination. I was very pleased to work with uh, Frederick Manfred's daughter Freya and her husband, Tom Pope, along with Ben Vanderkoy, Tom Brackey from Laverne, and my longtime friend, Alan Lathrop, who all of you know from Northwest Architectural Archives, you know, also has a very important Frederick Manfred connection. And all these individuals are here with us tonight. I know, I know some of them would like to speak as well. You know, I hadn't been to Blue Mound State Park for many years. It was, the last time I was there, I was preparing a National Register nomination for the original park that was developed with WPA assistance during the New Deal. Now, at the time, the, the park manager said, we have a pretty interesting house here on, on the property. Perhaps you'd like to see it. So he took me to see the house and I have to say, I hadn't seen anything like it. And I don't know that I have, you know, quite since then. So it was interesting for me personally to return to Blue Mound State Park after so many years and prepare a second nomination. Now, I think you'll agree this is a fascinating property and it's unusual to have a property 
But two such strong areas of significance, literature and architecture, that's not often the case. In fact, I'd recently uh, spoken about the house to the Minnesota chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians. And I was asked a question about the level of sub significance. And as Amy noted, the, the level is statewide, but the person posing the question to me was in fact really asking me if I believe the house was of national significance. And I think an analysis and considering uh, concerning national significance could certainly be warranted and but would require an additional level of, of research. Um, but depending how things uh, evolve with the house, I think it would be an interesting endeavor. I think the house uh, clearly and has the potential for for national indeed national significance. Just one small technical point I wanted to, to bring up. Uh, a minor question arose about a first name of an individual mentioned in the nomination. I'll resolve this with Jenny, and if we meet, need to make an adjustment, we'll we'll make the change. It pertains to the first name of Frederick Manfred's father. Now, I know there are others here tonight who will want to speak about the house and the efforts to save the Manfred house and the Save the Manfred house group, but I just want to comment that I think the group is is wonderfully impressive. I mean, they clearly want to do whatever it would take to preserve this house from raising the fund, funding to do whatever might be needed. Uh, and one thing I want to mention in terms of what is in, might be included would be an historic uh, or would be a, a conditions assessment by a, an historical architect. No historical architect has ever looked at this house, and that that true that truly uh, that truly needs to happen. And up to this point, the Department of Natural Resources has not allowed that, has not allowed that to happen. But to save the Manfred group certainly wants to, wants to be proceeding in, in, that, in that direction and look toward the preservation of the property. But as a final comment uh, to the board tonight, I just want to um, remark that the board might wish to take note of the issue of publicly owned properties and the state's responsibility you know, for their maintenance. Thank you, and, and any questions for me? Thanks, Rolf. I don't know if anyone has any questions now. Um, we'll, well come back to you in the discussion. Board, oh, yeah, Chris has got a question. Member, Shulky, I'm just wondering, oh, so Rolf, you were not allowed interior access, is that correct? Correct. Oh, okay. Even with protective gear? Well, you know, it, when the project first, first um, began, I thought this was going to be a possibility because DNR was not allowing access to the house. So Dennis and I discussed this point and he spoke to the um, Office of the National Register in Washington, D.C. to make sure this would not be some hurdle in the in the nomination process. And the National Register understood the, the issue and just asked that we do the best to include plans, which I did, discuss changes, which was also done. and. Even remarkably, I was pleased to get some photos through a window, which then at least resulted in two two contemporary photos. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, Amy, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I I'm glad Ralph mentioned that because I do have. I, I do have that email back and forth um, between Dennis and uh, the the National Park Service of whether or not not being able to go into the the interior if that was going to be an issue. So thanks, Rolf, for bringing that up. Um, I also forgot to mention that we have some letters that were sent. Oh, I forgot to ask. I'm sorry, Amy. <laughs> that's, that's quite all right. So. I'm going to uh, summarize. We have 3 letters that that our office received on this um, particular. Uh, property or nomination and the 1st is from Freya Manfred and Thomas Pope. Um, they are both here at, at the meeting. Um, and this has been sent to all the board members. Um, so it's, it's several pages and is just a wonderful documentation of the, the various um, books and just telling a story about the. The, the importance of this property in in uh, Frederick Manfred, uh, his writings. And so I it's, it, I won't be able to summarize it. <laughs> it gets 
Frey is the writer herself, so it was wonderfully done. But um, I, I think, too, the other thing that we're going to do is I will have our um, John Disher, I'll have him put all of the letters on our website um, under the meeting, the media agenda, so they can all become part of the record. Um, so the public, I know, didn't receive these letters and um, won't be able to read them unless we get them posted on our website. So we'll make sure that we do that for all of the, the written, um, the letters that we've received on this. So um, I will I will let uh, Freya uh, do a much better job at, at, at summarizing uh, her written letter. And then the second one we have from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. And um, they, uh, it's from Ben Miller and Ann Pearson Weiss. And they talk about the importance of uh, Frederick Manfred as an author and how um, this place um, is a, a vital monument in the literary history of the state uh, and indeed of, of America. So um, they are in support of the, the National Register nomination. And then the final letter was a late, um, a late edition. So it, it really just got emailed to the board members right I mean, about right at the start of this meeting. So I, I'm assuming that the board hasn't had uh, board members haven't had a chance to to review this. But the the final letter is from the DNR, and it is signed by the Parks and Trail Division Director Ann Pierce, which um, doesn't speak much to the the National Register nomination and whether or not. There's no recommendation on meeting criteria or not meeting criteria as the board is is looking at this, and that's the decision they're making this evening. But they talk about their responsibilities and just some of the more recent history of the house um, that it stopped. It was closed in uh, closed to the public in 2015 and was uh, deemed unsafe at the time. Um, and so it talks more about them the the DNR's planning efforts and they had TKDA. Um, assess the condition of the house back in 2018, um, and that it would it would cost approximately two million dollars at that time, um, but it would no longer reflect the original architecture. So there's they go into the national resources that are um, nearby in the area and a little bit more on the Manfred House background. Um, so again. We will get all three of these letters put up on our website as part of the public record. So anyone who um, is part of the public can can also read these letters that are part of the record. Thank you. If I could just point out that TKDA did not um, access the interior of the house. Their work real largely involved a look at the surrounding land and potential changes there so it's um it type of analysis that really is needed has not happened thank you thanks ralph uh before we turn to board discussion about this are there any other comments from the audience i'd like to comment go ahead introduce yourself please hi um i'm freya manfred and I'll try to summarize this letter that I wrote to some degree at any rate. I just want to thank all the people on the Manfred, Save the Manfred House for certain, and also particularly Ralph Anderson. Um, uh, Rolf Anderson, um, I just want to speak mostly to the literary and historical significance of the home. Um, Dad was a pretty imposing figure, Mr. Manfred Frederick, uh, and in the 1980s he was nominate or named as one of the 100 most influential influential Minnesotans in the uh, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Uh, he read and supported the work of many Minnesota writers, but also the writers of the entire Upper Midlands and the United States. Uh, these writers, many of them visited at our home in Blue Mound, and I grew up there at least from age 15 to 30, I lived there. And then later I wrote a memoir about my father. It's called uh, Frederick Manfred, A Daughter Remembers, um, after he died in 1994. Um, it just examines my relationship with him and provides insights into his writing, but mo and also particularly into his lifelong effort to create a series of novels that would help to document the settlement of the American West uh, and, and celebrate the character, history, and destiny of this land. 
uh, that he wrote upon. Uh, he was the oldest of six brothers, uh, born on a farm in Dune, Iowa, and he chose to live and work in Minnesota all his life, in, even though many writers uh, in, encouraged him to move to New York or LA or somewhere where he'd get more attention. He wrote his own obituary at one por- point, and he described, uh, this, he said, Eastern critics were inclined to hail him as a new important voice in American liter- letters, which is true in New York Times and so on. Uh, but uh, some became disenchanted with his work became, because it became apparent that he wasn't writing caustically about the Upper Midlands. Uh, of Instead, uh, what, like his friend and mentor, Sinclair Lewis, he was celebrating his own country by telling his version of the truth about it. And he wrote in depth with great insight about all its aspects from Indian times to contemporary times. And along the way, he invented a name for the region, Siouxland. And then uh, later, he also continued to write about his work, uh, what he wanted to accomplish there on Blue Mound. He, we called it Blue Mound. Uh, it was, he said, it was my dream for many years to be able to finish a long hallway of pictures in fiction, dealing with the country I call Siouxland from 1800 to the day I die. And not only must the history be fairly accurate and the description of flora and fauna precise and the use of language of place and time beautiful, but the delineation of the people by way of characterization must be living and illuminating. It has long been my thought that if a, that a place finally selects the people who best reflect it, give it voice and allow it to have um, a, make a cultural contribution to the sum of all world culture under the sun. Um, when he was dying in the Laverne Hospital at age 82, I watched his complex and brilliant intelligence fade in and out. I also felt the kingdom of his imagination, Siouxland, dying with him. And despite his having written 33 books every day, just about every day in the six weeks he was dying, he spoke every day of, I, Freya, I want to do more for the arts in America. Um, I can go on and summarize some work here of uh, the Professor John Rosmerski and various literary scholars discuss his work. I just put that all in the paper. I don't want to take up too much of your time. But when I was a girl, he, he did also take me down to Siouxland a lot from where we lived up in Bloomington, Minnesota. And uh, he was re- doing research for his novels in the area. We drove there then and would stop at Blue Mountains. And Dad would talk about his dream of someday moving back there, closer to Siouxland, the land of his birth. And when the state of Minnesota insisted that we leave the house at Blue Mound, having promised that Dad could stay there until he died, he wrote a 1974 letter to the director of the Department of the DNR in St. Paul. Just the first line I'll read to you. He said, I fear I'll never be able to write as well again as I once wrote here. I wrote by far my best books here. Uh, one of those would be Scarlet Plume that some of you have mentioned. Um, so he wanted to build a house on the mountains, a home in which he could make his vision of America and of American literature come alive. And he did build a house on the mountains. His house embodies his spirit uh, just, and just as his vision will never die, neither should the house which embodies it. I think I will, can I conclude by just reading a couple of lines from the, the book, the novel, um, Scarlet Plume. He, he, he had a vision, by the way, of the main character in Conquering Horse, which is his other Native American novel. He had a vision of the main character in that novel when he was up in his teepee, the, man, the, the main character whose name is No Name appeared to him, just came in a vision to him. But anyway, this was the other one, Scarlet Plume. He said, it says, the Yanktons will soon be dead, all of them. Our homeland will be soon plowed and burned away. All of it, we and our land, we are too naked. The great wagon guns of the white man's war and the hard plows of the white man's peace have put holes in us. My dreams have deserted me, even those that came only in the night. I have no dreams. When I look forward, I look into blackness. When I look backward, I look into blackness. I am dead ahead and I am dead behind. I have no more to say. I think that my father wrote, was able to write it that way because of what was happening to him and his house at the time. That's it, thank you. Thank you, thanks very much.
Does anyone else from the audience uh, want to speak? Anyone else? Amy, do you see any hands anywhere? Oh, I do not. Ralph, did you have something? You know, I think I think Al and Ben were going to comment. Al or Ben? Al is on. Is Al anybody on mute or? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Al, would you introduce yourself for the record, please? Yes, please. Uh, Al Lathrop. I was. Uh, I'm now retired from the University of Minnesota, where I was a curator, among other things, of Fred Manfred's papers. And what I'd like to uh, say um, is that uh, some of the, a lot of the things that Freya was talking about really came back uh, to hit me. Um, I've been gone from there for a number of years, but I can remember Fred very well and visited the house uh, two or three times uh, with him. Um, and it was due to the fact that Fred was so meticulous in keeping his records uh, that we have had an amazing collection of this material, which was used by the Saving the Manfred House group um, to research the National Register nomination. Uh, without this material, uh, I don't think that would have been possible. And um, so the house has has associations that go beyond just Fred uh, and architecture. Uh, it's a spirit, and the spirit I think lives in his papers. Uh, if you read them, um, there's a lot of material in there that would be um, that would really evoke his his uh, spirit and his personality, and. Um, it was my pleasure to know him for a number of years, and um, it was always a joy to uh, to see him, and a joy to go through his house, which was amazing in many ways. Um, not least because of the teepee on it, which was his study space. So um, I'm here to fully support this nomination, uh, even though I don't have a vote, but but I feel that. It's uh, it's something that absolutely should be done to honor his memory um, and uh, really to honor the history and prehistory of Blue Mound, which uh, is, I think, one of the most evocative places in Minnesota. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Al. I have just a few comments, and then I'd like to turn it over to Tom Brackey to talk about our website. Uh, but let me say first who I am. I'm Ben Vanderkoy. I live about a mile from the house. In fact, as I look out the window, I can see the very top of the teepee poking over the prairie. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a site that's very familiar to me and to people who visit the park. It really has been an attraction for, for everyone. In addition to that being here in town i am the literary executor for the manfred estate and i've been working with freya and tom and others uh on the and alan uh on the uh works of fred manfred to uh, keep the work alive and to refresh it whenever possible uh and i'm also uh, an advisor to the uh, national trust um i've been that for almost 10 years so i'm, I'm very concerned about historic preservation and frankly, the, the, the need to preserve this house and to have it be of a national register. But I'm not alone in that. And that's why I want to turn this over to Tom Brackey. Uh, he's also on Save the Manfred, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Save the Manfred House uh, Board. And uh, he put, put up a, a, just a wonderful website with the assistance of his son. And, uh, and Tom, if you could talk a bit about that and about the survey that the DNR did and the importance of the house to the people who took the survey. Thanks, Ben. Well, I am Tom Bracky. Oh, I'm in an unusual spot, so I hopefully it's not too noisy here. But um, yes, this has been. Uh, I grew up in Laverne and have known the Manfreds uh, a long time. Knew Fred um, and my family did. Um, 
And this has been, uh, you know, is a labor of love, honestly, for us, obviously, because uh, we very much feel that the house should be um, saved and that not enough has been done um, to recognize the significance of the house by the DNR or to really do anything to uh, ensure it's, that it is saved. Um, the DNR did a survey last spring regarding his three design concepts um, that it came up with, all of which included the destruction of the house. Um, and uh, they've shared that that information has not been uh, made available publicly, but they shared it with us. Um, and there was just overwhelming opposition to um, each the design concepts. Um, there were some 542 or something like that people that responded to the survey. Um, and uh, in terms of the particular question about which of the design uh, ideas um, they favored, 78% uh, said none of the above. Um, and very smatterings for the other ones. But if you read the comments, and the comments are on the website from that question, uh, you'll get a sense of where the public at is regarding this house. Um, something that's never really been recognized is the, the breadth of support uh, to save this house. And so that's what we wanted to do as an organization was to bring that forth and to do whatever we could uh, to help save the house but also, the, as Ben mentioned, we've got a website that's got uh, lots of great information about Fred, some pictures of the house, information about the house. And we encourage anybody who's listening, who's interested in the house, to go to the website at savethemanfredhouse.org uh, and take a look at it, because I think the case is uh, very persuasive. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, John. Any other comments from the audience? Anyone else? All right, board members, it's your turn. Any comments or discussion from the board? Okay, it looks like board member Decker has his hand raised. Mikey Fikema's home is where the buffalo roam. <laughs> All right, and then we've got, it looks like board member Stark with his hand raised. I assume that was a quote from a book. <laughs> <laughs> I have some reading to do since I've uh, been reading the nominations here. Uh, Freya, thank you very much for telling us and sharing the stories of your dad. That's really nice. Um, I think there's a long history on this site and the, the native stories that uh, Freya, your dad told about um, that goes thousands of years, and I think we have to have a right or a need that we need to save this house for at least a few more years to keep that spirit alive that's there. It may eventually return, but right now we need to save it and keep it alive. Um, to be able to and assess a building from the outside really does nothing. It doesn't tell you anything. If that's truly the case, you have to be able to get inside, see what the wood conditions are. Um, building against rock isn't a, it's a challenge, but it's not an impossibility. So it needs a better study on this. So I think on our effort, I'm really supportive of this and think we should vote it in. Thank you. Oh, and, and as long as I've got everybody's attention, I do have to recuse myself from the next one because I have a conflict of interest. So I'll join us after that one's over. Great. Thank you. Uh, board member Olson has his hand up and I see board member Solomonson as well. We'll be next. So, okay. Board so Wilson? yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for Rolf, I guess. I think in his remarks, I heard him mention that he had been out there earlier doing a documentation on the park itself. And so does that earlier nomination work play at all with this current property or are they completely independent? You know, Steve, the, 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 the initial nomination that I had completed for the park you know, focused on the on the WPA rustic style architecture and the original lands associated with the park, which date from the 19, the 1930s. The Manfred House 
um, is at the south end of the Blue Mountain. The original park is at the north end. And so they they really, they aren't even historically contiguous, although lands have been purchased in the meantime that I, I that do create a connection b between the two. But the point then is that the initial nomination really had no bearing on this one and they are, they are um, discontiguous. Thanks, Ralph. Board Member Solinson had her hand up. I did. Um, I just want to thank you all who've been involved in bringing this nomination forward. Uh, I agree with John that uh, being able to uh, examine and document the interior is going to be important at one point uh, when it's possible to do so. In the meantime, uh, working with those limitations, uh, it's a beautifully pre presented nomination from the photographs to uh, the, the writing and uh, then the additional treat of being able to read Freya's letter. And so I just want to say I strongly support this nomination. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Kate. Any other discussion questions from the board? Looking for raised hands in the list at the moment. And seeing none, I'll check to see if there's anyone who wants to make a motion about this. I so move. And that was John Decker. John Decker makes the motion. It looks like John Stark was holding up two fingers there. So John Stark is seconding the motion. Any other discussion before we vote? All right, I'll call the roll. Board Member Decker. Aye. Board Member Dyer. Aye. Board Member James. Aye. Board Member Lavasser. She left. Oh, that's right. She had to go. All right. Thank you, Board Member Mann. Aye. Board Member Olson. Aye. Board Member Schulke. Aye. Board Member Solomonson. Aye. Board Member Stark. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thanks very much, everyone. And now we're on to our second nomination, the Amhoist Tower in St. Paul, Ramsey County. And Amy, is it you again? It is me again. Good, thank you. Let me get my screen shared. Okay. Amhoist Tower rises on the west side of downtown St. Paul, overlooking historic Rice Park. An entrance at 345 St. Peter Street serves the tower's offices on floors 1 through 20. A separate entrance at 49 Fourth Street serves the residential condominiums on floors 21 through 25. Completed in 1983 through 1984, the property's modern design reflects its period of construction. The property includes a 25-story curtain wall tower and an integrated five-story parking structure clad in burnished concrete block and painted metal louvers. The firm chosen to, de to design the project was Bennett Ringwald Wolfsfeld Jarvis Gardner Inc., more commonly known as BRW. The general contractor for the project was Kraus Anderson, and five stories were designed as residences. The remaining floors were built out as office space. Each condo and office was left unfinished so that the owner could customize the interior spaces as they saw fit. The left image is south. Uh, and east facades looking northwest, and the right image is north and west facades of the parking structure looking southwest. From a humble start in 1882, the American Hoist and Derrick Company quickly became an international leader in the manufacture of heavy duty cranes and other industrial equipment. In 1886 to 1887, the company began to build a manufacturing complex located at 63 South Robert Street. The complex was the company's headquarters as well as a sprawling manufacturing site. The left image is a view from the tower to the southeast, former site of American Hoist and Derrick Plant is visible on the opposite side of the river. And the right image is aerial of Robert Street Plant in 1965 looking northeast, 
the Mississippi River and Robert Street Bridges, Bridge are visible top left. American Hoist and Derrick began in 1882 as the Franklin Manufacturing Company. In the 1800s, the population of St. Paul was exploding and the frontier continued to push west, fueling demand for construction equipment and materials. American Hoist specialized in the design and manufacture of hoists, steam shovels, and railroad equipment. The company received its first patent in 1885. It was a time of rapid technological advancement. As power sources transitioned from animals to new forms of energy, the company kept pace, introducing steam-powered hoists in its product line in 1889 and electric hoists in 1891. The late 19th century also saw a tremendous evolution in the scale and capacity of American industry, resulting in a demand for larger and stronger equipment. American hoists began selling internationally by the mid-1890s. World War I stimulated more orders, and by the end of the war, the company had branches in Chicago, New York, Pittsburgh, New Orleans, and Seattle. The company's products were used to build the Panama Canal and Mount Rushmore. The left image is interior of the office lobby looking east towards the entrance from St. Peter Street. The right image is the interior of the office lobby looking southwest at the elevators, guard station, and a second floor balcony. Despite, despite depression-related private sector slumps, federal relief projects that produced dams, bridges, and other massive civil works needed the company's cranes and other equipment. Orders surged again with the onset of World War II when the push to arm the country brought intense demand for the company's products. The left image is the elevator lobby on the second floor looking southwest. The right image is the elevator lobby on the third floor. American Hoist embarked on near continuous expansion and diversification in the post-war years, and by 1960, the net worth of American Hoist and its subsidiaries had jumped from $3.6 million to $6.2 million. The left image is an illustration of how the scale of its cranes had grown from 1895, the silhouetted crane, to 1975, the yellow crane, both the world's largest when they were built. The right image is an office floor. Layout and finishes vary from floor to floor. American Hoist expansion elevated its stature in the business world. The company achieved listing on the New York Stock Exchange, Stock Exchange in 1965 with the ticker symbol AHO, joining only a handful of St. Paul firms on that premier trading floor. In 1969, American Hoist achieved an even more elite status with its listing in the Fortune 500. The left image is an office floor, layout and finishes vary, and the right image is another office image, layout and finishes also varying. Throughout the 1970s, the company continued to add businesses to its portfolio, in part to expand in-house manufacturing capacity. Demand for the company's products was also strong from energy-related development in the Middle East, Alaska, and Brazil. By 1976, international business represented 44% of the company's receipts, up from 20% five years earlier. The left image is an office floor with a balcony in the background. Uh, those are up on the higher floors. The 19th and 20th, 20th floors were originally intended to be residential condominiums and have balconies. Because residential sales were slow, these floors were used for offices instead. Layout and finishes vary from floor to floor, and then the right image are the balconies on, are on floor 19 through 23 from the exterior, or the interior, excuse me. In the 1970s, the plant was one of the city's largest employers with approximately 1,850 people located at the company's, company headquarters in St. Paul. However, the increased flooding risks of the century-old site, coupled with the need to present a more polished brand, led the Amhoist company to begin considering new options for its headquarters. The left image is the elevator lobby on a residential condominium floor. Looking east, finishes are varying again. And the right image is elevator lobby and corridor on the residential condominium floor looking west. 
By the mid 20th century, downtown St. Paul was not faring well. By the late 1970s, the Amhoist Tower site was considered underutilized and was purchased by the Yorktown Investment Company. Redeveloping the site was considered a substantial commitment and the speculative real estate project received significant support from the St. Paul Port Authority. Of the tower's 25 to $30 million budget, only 5 million came from private investors. In 1981, Yorktown convinced Amhoist to relocate its headquarters to the new tower, agreeing to name the building after the anchor tenant. The 1982 groundbreaking was done with an Amhoist crane, and the company was expected to bring 200, approximately 200 employees and occupy seven floors of the finished building as early as 1983. Amhoist featured the new headquarters building on the cover of its 1984 annual report. Uh, and the right image is a detail of the east facade looking west, canopy for the office lobby entrance in the lower left corner. Amhoist's decision to relocate its headquarters to downtown St. Paul came at a time when the company was experiencing growth. However, conditions would change for the company and its industry between that time and the date the, the move occurred. The crane market crashed, a victim of oversupply in the oil industry and a worldwide recession. Despite its financial concerns, the company honored its commitment and began to occupy its offices in Amhoist Tower in December of 1983. Despite multiple changes in leadership and streamlining efforts, the American Hoist and Dare Company was unable to recover. In 1989, the company merged with Coast America and became the Amdura Corporation, the headquarters were moved to Denver, Colorado. Only a small cohort of employees, including the Harris Division, would remain in the St. Paul Tower. The left image is the St. Paul Port Authority's 1981 annual report, which featured a color rendering of the Amhoist Tower on the inside of the cover. And the right image is the west and south facades of the tower and parking structure looking east-northwest. By the mid 20th century, downtown St. Paul was not faring well. Oh, did I hit the wrong button? Yes, sorry about that. The property's period of significance begins in 1983, the year the company moved from its 1890s headquarters and ends in 1985 when the company consolidated and the headquarters were moved to Denver. The company's St. Paul manufacturing plant that grew along the west bank of the Mississippi River since the 1880s has been demolished, leaving Amhoist Tower is the best representation as the best representation of American Hoist legacy today. American Hoist was the country's foremost manufacturer of large cranes for more than a century, and its equipment facilitated major construction projects around the world. The company was one of St. Paul's largest employers and one of the few to join the Fortune 500 and be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. For its association with this important company, Amhoist Tower is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. The current owner is participating in the state and federal historic tax credit programs. This property has been certified by the National Park Service as a certified historic structure through a Part 1 application. Thank you, Amy. And is there any correspondence? We did not receive any correspondence on this particular property. Thank you. So we remembered to cover that and turns out there's nothing to do with it. Okay. Anyone from the audience have any uh, statements or comments about this project? I see Charlene has her hand raised. Charlene, would you introduce yourself and do your statement, please? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Charlene Royce, um, historian with Hess Royce and Company, and I prepared the nomination. And I'd just like to give you a little bit of background about the process. Um, I was approached by George Sherman of Sherman Associates, who's a developer, and we've worked with a lot. He's performed magic on all sorts of properties, including um, Riverside Plaza, also known as Cedar Square West. So um, he, he likes to push the limit, but he recognized that there's really a problem that's um, merging of um, office buildings uh, having redundant space or having vacant space. And that's the case with this building. There are five floors of condominiums in the very top of it. And the rest of the building, all 20 floors, is virtually vacant. So um, he wanted to consider redeveloping it for housing, which is needed. 
um, much more than office space these days, and uh, and asked me to see if this was might potentially qualify for the register. Um, I was kind of skeptical, to be perfectly honest. Um, didn't know much about Amherst, and didn't you know this building had just never caught my eye. Um, so I'm, I'm not really. I wasn't really sure how the analysis would come out. Um, but when I dug in, the more and more I dug into it, the more fascinating I found the history and, and uh, just really was overwhelmed by how significant this company is, um, really internationally. Um, so I was, I became convinced that it really did qualify for the National Register, um, drafted the nomination in the part one, and then um, called Dennis, because I wanted him to come and see the property, especially because it was a Criterion G property. Um, it, it's not an intuitive property that a preservationist wants to just go out and hunt. So I thought it'd be good if Dennis and I went and toured the building. I knew that because of the pandemic, it might be, he might not want to go. Um, but he did agree to go, which I really appreciated. And in early December, we went and had a look at the building. And he arrived um, in the lobby very skeptical. Um, but after about an hour and a half of walking through the building and talking about the history, um, he became very enthusiastic about the, the property's significance and, and believed that it did qualify for the National Register. So um, I gave him the nomination of the Part 1, and he sent it into the National Park Service and said, you know, this will be a rubber stamp, it should be no problem. Well, the Park Service ended up being skeptical, um, and they rejected the Part 1. And the dentist still believed in the nomination and, and I believed in it as well. And he encouraged me to go back and do some additional research and, uh, and make some revisions. And um, being a historian, for those of you who are during the pandemic has been really not very easy um, because so many places you just couldn't do research like you were used to. But I did go back to the Minnesota Historical Society and was able to dig up both um, some really great records from the St. Paul Port Authority that I hadn't been able to get to earlier. And also two wonderful promotional um, videotapes that, that Amhoist had done in the early 80s. Um, the, um, the folks in the reading room at MHS, MNHS, and I managed to break two VCR machines before we finally found the one, one that would work. That technology is definitely going the way of the dinosaur. Um, but that was, uh, that was enough. Um, those pieces of information and that were enough um, and some discussions that Dennis and I had about um, making some revisions were enough so that when I revised the part one and he resubmitted it, the National Park Service uh, approved the part one. Um, so I really appreciated Dennis's help with this, and I'm managing to say this without crying, um, with, uh, with this nomination. And um, I'm here to an answer any questions you might have about the nomination. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, let's see. Anybody have any questions of Charlene? We can also do this in the discussion if there's anything that you wonder at this point or comes up later. I'm scanning for raised hands here. Amy, do you see anyone? I do not. Okay. Hang tight, Charlene. We might come back to you in a few minutes. Thanks. Any other uh, comments from the public? Anyone in the audience want to make a statement or a comment about this? Okay, then we are on to board discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. Nancy, I see you, but. Whoa. Maybe. She seems to be having a little difficulty with her audio. Yeah, I, I did try to mute others. There were a couple who were on, so I tried to mute others because sometimes you get a little feedback. So, so I think perhaps interject. Um, Nancy is uh, one of the condo owners, and she um, and the condo board and the members of anyone in the condo is, is very supportive of this project. So if she is unable to communicate that, um, at least I would like to in her stead. I wonder if Nancy can hear us. John, can she? Yeah, she looks like she can hear us. Yeah, we're still getting that repetition. John, can she um, leave the meeting and then come back in again? Yeah, that would probably be the best option right now. 
Okay, so Nancy, Nancy, did you hear that? Can yeah, you log I'll, out and start talk back in? Sure. Uh, Looks like she's working on it. And thank you for muting her. That's good. Oh, she doesn't have that much to add. She's in the chat, everyone. Check out the chat. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for being in the chat. Okay, thank you. Very good. That's that's what we needed to hear, and you found a way to tell us. That's very good. Appreciate that. Okay, is there anyone else who'd like to give it a try? Or anyone on the board want to jump into the discussion at this point? I do, board member Shulke. Thank you. Go ahead, board member Shulke. All right. So um from I'm gonna take a little devil's advocate position here. So please uh hopefully you can refute me. So base this we're we're asking to approve a nomination that is uh within uh does not meet the 50 year old threshold on the National Register. Is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the nomination uh, is basically asking for a variance on that rule, and and I'm I just want to know why. I mean, uh, I know they're trying to get historic uh, tax credits, but uh, why, as a uh, state review board, should we approve this? The building isn't gonna, isn't falling down; it's not in danger of demolition. Um, so, please convince me why we should. Uh, um, you know, have a variance on what I thought was a pretty standard rule of uh, 50 year rule. And I'll wait for everyone to refute me or yeah, to Charlotte. explain to me. I think Charlene, Charlene you're, on you mute. To, you're muted, Charlene. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, um, well, that's a great question. And um, I mean, the National Register isn't just a tool for stopping demolition. I think it's a, it's a tool for um, acknowledging properties that are significant. And um, we have a precedent for doing other properties that uh, do not meet the 50 year rule and that qualify for criteria consideration G. Um, we did, uh, well, Cedar Square West, the other, another one I mentioned, um, which is now known as Riverside Plaza at uh, Cedar Riverside, and people still can't quite believe that got on the National Register, but that was very important. And I believe this one is too. We've also nominated KB Plaza successfully. Um, in that case, it was to stop the demolition. <laughs> and that was also successful. But um, but there's certain properties, like when the IDS building was built in downtown Minneapolis, that's my classic example of, you know, you could tell from the day it was built that that was going to be significant. Other properties, it takes a little longer. Um, with Amweist, one of the things that I think is really important about it is that um, it's what we've got to represent the very important legacy of the American Heist and Divot Company. Um, the, the major manufacturing facility they had over um, on the West Side Flats is gone. Um, there's really nothing else that, that documents this important um, company, and this was incredibly important. I know as, as a kid, I was aware of this company, but until I did the research, I had no idea what, you know, what they'd done. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in industrial archaeology, and from that perspective, this company is like, you know, one of the major players. So um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that, but I, I just think that the, the National Register, it's a guideline, it's not a rule um, for the 50-year mark. And um, as long as we have enough scholarly information and perspective to be able to make the case, I think there's no, uh, no problem in making the case. Yeah, I mean, Charlene, I'm not, I'm definitely not arguing its significance. I thought it was a well-crafted uh, nomination. I'm just, uh, and, and I'm glad you're you're saying this because I was just, you know, why are we um, circumventing this? And, and like you said, I guess it's it's not necessarily a rules are meant to be not broken, but but gone around. So thank you for your your response. Uh, board member Olson, I see that you're there, but uh, Ginny's raised her hand and maybe has something to contribute to this particular discussion. So I'm going to call on Ginny Way first. I do. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I just wanted to quote the bulletin. So bulletin 15, the National Register bulletin says, quote, the, con the consideration of the 50 year rule 
um, quote, guards against the listing of properties of passing contemporary interest and ensures that the National Register is a list of truly historic places. So the 50 year guideline, as Charlene correctly pointed out, it's not a rule, it's simply a, a way for us to understand the context of a company and the significance of a property in this particular case. So um, the State Historic Preservation Office believes that the company itself does meet that that threshold of significance and that this property is the one that best represents it and therefore it meets criteria consideration G. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Jenny. Board member Olson waiting patiently with his <laughs> hand in the air. You're on. Well, this is an, a nomination a civil engineer can fully embrace. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's just start there. As a civil engineer who still details Crosby clips on uh, projects, it was fun to read about that. It was fun to read about cranes big enough to read that lift the entire population of St. Cloud. <laughs> it, the only thing that could have put a better bow on this thing is if there was a mining equipment crane up at the Sudan mine that was attributed to, the, to them that we could identify as well. So when it comes time to advance this, I will fully embrace it and ask for a motion to go forward, I guess. Okay, so everyone heard board member Olson um, volunteer in advance to to uh, make the motion to forward this. So don't be. I think it's it's more like uh, boys with their toys or civil engineers with their toys, right? Well, whatever. Yeah. Uh, Amy Spong has her hand raised. Amy, I just wanted to mention really quick um, with board member Schulke's uh, questions too. Um, we heard Charlene also talk about the underutilization of the building. So, you know, it might appear like it's in, it's in good shape. It's not, you know, falling down. Um, but in addition to the recognition that the National Register brings um, along with being able to utilize tax credit um, incentives, um, you know, so I, I guess I didn't realize that that many floors were actually, <laughs> were actually empty and, and not being used. So, you know, that's a big part of the, um, the incentive piece with federal credits is the underutilization as well. That's Thank all. You. Other questions or discussion? I see that board member Decker has his hand raised. You're on, John. Hi. Um, Cold Spring Granite, most of their derricks were received from American Hoist. So without them, there wouldn't be any granite buildings or decent granite buildings around. So I think it's a very important nomination. Number, I have a question for Char Charlene. When they, if they redevelop this building, are they gonna keep the name? That I think has not yet been decided, but I think there's definitely been a push to do it. And I've been encouraging them to do that. I mean, right now it's called Landmark Towers, which is like, eh. Um, so I think uh, I think Amherst would be much better, and, and nobody else is using the name anymore because the, the business isn't around. So I'm hoping that they'll they'll use it, but not sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Scrolling through for the magic, I have a comment sign, and it looks like we're maybe at a point that a certain civil engineer might want to suggest a motion for us. I would like to make a motion that we advance this to the National Register for consideration. Thank you, Board Member Olson. Is there a second? I second. And I didn't see who that was, but Board Member Schulke. Schulke board, I'm sorry, Board Member Schulke second. That's good. Thank you very much. Yep. Any further discussion? All right, we'll vote. Board Member Decker. Aye. Board Member Dyer? Aye. Board Member James? Aye. Board Member Mann? Aye. Board Member Olson? Aye. Board Member Schulke? Aye. Board Member Solomonson? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that looks like a lot of yes votes, right? I think we're good on that one. Uh, Amy, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Is there anything else that we need to do hear no think about before we no. no but thanks everyone for um for a good meeting tonight appreciate it
Do we have a motion to adjourn? I so move. Just that was board member Decker. Thank you, board member Decker. And I, I think that does the deed. I think we're done. Thanks everybody. See you in a few months.